is from Paul's letter to the Romans, chapter 12. For those of you who visit us here this morning, we're working our way through Paul's letter to the Romans, and we're in chapter 12. We'll read the whole of this chapter. Romans 12, verse 1. Therefore, I urge you, brothers, in view of God's mercy, to offer your bodies as living sacrifices, holy and pleasing to God. This is your spiritual act of worship. Do not conform any longer to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Then you will be able to test and approve what God's will is, his good, pleasing and perfect will. For by the grace given me, I say to every one of you, do not think of yourself more highly than you ought, but rather think of yourself with sober judgment in accordance with the measure of faith God has given you. Just as each of us has one body with many members, and these members do not all have the same function, so in Christ we who are many form one body, and each member belongs to all the others. We have different gifts according to the grace given us. If a man's gift is prophesying, let him use it in proportion to his faith. If it is serving, let him serve. If it is teaching, let him teach. If it is encouraging, let him encourage. If it is contributing to the needs of others, let him give generously. If it is leadership, let him govern diligently. If it is showing mercy, let him do it cheerfully. Love must be sincere. Hate what is evil, cling to what is good. Be devoted to one another in brotherly love. Honour one another above yourselves. Never be lacking in zeal, but keep your spiritual fervour, serving the Lord. Be joyful in hope, patient in affliction, faithful in prayer. Share with God's people who are in need. Practice hospitality. Bless those who persecute you. Bless and do not curse. Rejoice with those who rejoice. Mourn with those who mourn. Live in harmony with one another. Do not be proud, but be willing to associate with people of low position. Do not be conceited. Do not repay anyone evil for evil. Be careful to do what is right in the eyes of everybody. If it is possible... As far as it depends on you, live at peace with everyone. Do not take revenge, my friends, but leave room for God's wrath. For it is written, it is mine to avenge. I will repay, says the Lord. On the contrary, if your enemy is hungry, feed him. If he is thirsty, give him something to drink. In doing this, you will heap burning coals on his head. Do not be overcome by evil but overcome evil with good. Amen. Let's pray. Father, again, we're just so mindful of how dependent we are upon you, that by your Holy Spirit you would write the truth of your word upon our hearts, minds and wills. We know how easy it is to sit in church and hear faithful Bible ministry and to resist it or to allow it to go through one ear and out the other, as it were. And this is why we appeal to you. We want to be a changed people. We want to be a community here as a church that reflect the reality of who we are in your Son, Jesus Christ. And so we ask this morning that you would challenge us and change us and that it might all be for the glory of your Son, in whose name we pray together. Amen. Well, if you were here last week, you know we kind of ran out of, well, I was going to say steam, but I actually still have plenty of steam left, but we ran out of time. And uh, so we want to revisit um, a little bit of what we weren't able to finish last week because we're looking in particular at verses 9 to 21. There's a lot there. It's almost like a series of bullet points that Paul is making. 
But before we look at that, we must be very, very careful to remind ourselves of the great principle that Paul lays down at the beginning of chapter 12. Now, if you're not familiar with the book of Romans, it's a wonderful book. Paul tells us in the first chapter that his desire is to open up the news of what he calls the gospel of God. And he describes that gospel in chapter 1, in verse 2, as being something he promised beforehand through the prophets in the Holy Scriptures. He's referring to what we know as the Old Testament. Regarding his son, that is, the gospel is all about Jesus, who as to his human nature was a descendant of David, and who through the spirit of holiness was declared with power to be the Son of God by his resurrection from the dead. That's Paul's desire as he writes this book. It is to proclaim the good news, the gospel of Jesus Christ, who is both man and God. Now, we know he's writing this letter to Christians in Rome. He's never been there. His desire is to go there, though. And we think to provide a sort of bridgehead for taking the gospel into Western Europe. He makes reference towards the end of this letter of going to what his desire to go to Spain. So he sort of sends this letter ahead to pave the way. And it's a very strategic letter. It's great for us because these 11 chapters that we've been studying open up what the gospel is. But Paul also realises, it seems, that he's writing to a church that is in some measure divided, that's probably going too far, but within which there are tensions. You see, what had happened in the church at Rome is that the gospel had gone there probably as a result of the persecution that broke out in Jerusalem following the stoning of Stephen in Acts 6. Christians had run for their lives. Some had ended up in Rome. It's a big trading area as well, massive center of politics and commerce uh, and all of that in the Roman Empire. But they'd spoken the gospel and those who'd heard it and had responded initially were Jewish people. And they'd believed, they'd become Christians. And then the gospel gently began to be making an impact on Gentile people, on, on Roman citizens, and maybe Greeks as well. And some of them began to be converted. And so this church is initially made up, it seems, of a kind of blend of mainly Jewish converts and some Gentile converts. But then this persecution the, uh, on the Jewish community in Rome, uh, it's referred to in the book of Acts about that happening, and... Uh, the Christian believers have to run. And so it's the Gentile believers that are left. While the Jewish believers are away because of the persecution, the work in Rome really blossoms and more and more Gentile believers come to faith. The persecution against the Jews eases. They're able to return back to their homes, their businesses or whatever. And as they come back, the Christians discover that this church where they weren't once as Jewish believers were in the majority, now they're actually in the minority. And so Paul, as he writes this letter, to prepare his ministry into Western Europe, is also writing to emphasize our oneness as believers, despite the two massive distinctions in the early world, Jew and Gentile. The gospel unites. Now he's been building that argument through these 11 chapters quite brilliantly until he has brought us to this point of rejoicing in God's grace at the end of chapter 11 with that doxology in verses 33 to 36. Oh, how the depth of the riches of the wisdom of God and so on. But now comes the challenge of the chapters 12 right the way through to the last chapter, chapter 16. What does this now mean? We are one in Jesus Christ. The Jew-Gentile issue is flattened out by the gospel that brings us together in the one Saviour. But now there are the implications. How do we live? Now remember this letter has been written to an, it's pro written really to the epicentre of world power in the ancient world. This is Rome. We're talking about the Roman Empire, which is massively spreading. It's the superpower. This is like a letter being written today to Washington or Beijing. And Paul knows that these Christians face genuine, authentic challenges 
about living out the Christian faith in the reality of a hostile world. The Jewish persecution is fresh in the memories of people. And it's a reminder to us today that our faith, the faith we have in Jesus Christ, is not something that just brings us personal comfort. It's not something that just gives us identity in Christ. But it is something that is to be lived out. It's to impact the world. One of the big challenges often it's said today, and not just today, but in recent decades, is that the distinction between the world and the church is often being blurred. The tragic reality is that sometimes Christians can live lives that are not really even as good as their neighbours, let alone better than their neighbours. And yet if we are in Christ, we are called not only to believe and receive something wonderful, we are called to live it out. Jesus tells us that we, he is salt and light, but also we are to be salt and light. Paul, writing to the Philippians, tells us we are to shine like stars in the universe as we hold forth the word of life to a crooked and perverse generation. So how do we do it? Now, in verse 9 to verse 21, you've got this massive list of things that we are to do and not do. Verse 9 tells us that we are to love in a sincere way, hating what is evil and clinging to what is good. And you might say, well, this is where sometimes I get confused. Exactly what does that mean today in Llanelli or wherever you're from? What does it mean to hate what is evil as I go to school or college or work? Or as I go down the leisure centre, or I go for a coffee in town, or a meal, or something like that. What does it mean to cling to what is good? How does that boil down? How does that work itself out? Now, of course, what we have here are principles. The particular applications to a first century congregation are going to be different to the particular applications to a 21st century congregation. So, example, uh, the, the issues that we face today with the internet, which can be very, very wonderful and very useful and very helpful, particularly for Christians in the spread of the gospel. There are many people who've come to this church because they've discovered our web website. Folks have come to Cafe Church because of what they've seen on the internet about what we promote here. But there's a dark side as well. There are great evils on the internet. The whole area of internet pornography being the most obvious. Now, Paul isn't going to write about that in the first century. But he is going to provide us with principles which enable us to look at specifics in our age and in our generation and apply them. This is the reminder that you as a Christian have to be, by definition, a thinking person. How does this work out? What does it mean to be joyful in hope today as I live out my life? What does it mean not to repay evil for evil in Llanelli today? Now the problem with the list, as we saw last week in verse 9 to verse 21, is that it can really read just like that. And I want to tell you, and I will keep emphasising this, because it is so important and it really is for our good, that we dare not read one word in verse 9 to verse 21 outside of the generous driving principle behind all of this that we see in verse 1. And what do we see in verse 1? Well, look at it. Therefore, in response to everything I have written, Paul is saying, about the gospel, I urge you, brothers, in view of God's mercy, to present your bodies as living sacrifices, holy and pleasing to God. There are massive snares in the Christian life. One of the biggest is that you can view your sanctification, you can view the way in which you should live as a Christian, that the driving force for that is what do you get told on Sunday? What your tradition is, what your parents told you, peer pressure from other Christians. In other words, that you can find yourself living and functioning as a Christian because, well, this is the way everyone tells me I'm supposed to be doing it. That is not how the New Testament approaches sanctification. 
If your motivation for living a clean, godly life, if your motivation for not looking at internet porn, for not cheating on your tax return, for not lying in the workplace, for not being immoral, is simply a sense of pressure from the Christian community that this is what I should be doing, then you've really not grasped what, what Christ, the Christian life's about. No, says Paul in verse 1, the great driver, the force that drives you on as a Christian is the gospel. Therefore, I urge you, brothers, in view of God's mercy. And I said this to you last week. If your view of the gospel is small, your view of sanctification will be trivial. Perhaps our biggest problem today within the church is that our view and understanding of the gospel itself is so small. Our sloppy living, our compromised living, I think ultimately comes down to that. Our lack of enthusiasm for Christ-likeness and godliness and holiness is not because we have been exhort not exhorted enough or challenged enough. Those things have their place. But I think the problem is our view of God's mercy is so small. The one thing you need to live as a Christian and that I need is that God's Holy Spirit would show us through his word the riches and the wonder of what it means to be a Christian and that that same spirit would give us energy then to live for him. So we must be careful to see that the great driver in our lives is the gospel. The uh, Christian missionary C.T. Studd, he was an interesting man, he was... A, Cambridge or Oxford boffin. He was, uh, also played cricket for England. He came from an aristocratic family, basically millionaires. But he ended up going into a little part of Africa, pretty well unknown, and serving God there. And amongst many things that he said, he once said this, that really sums up what Paul is saying here in Romans 12. If Jesus Christ be God and died for me, if the gospel is what the gospel is, then no sacrifice can be too great for me to make for him. If your problem is difficulty in living sacrificially for Jesus Christ, it's not that you're a rubbish Christian. It's not that somehow you're weak-willed. It's actually you have too small a view of Jesus Christ and his work for you. And so our prayer must ever be, Lord, give us that big view of Christ. Every day when you begin the day, try to begin it with that view of him, of what he has done for you, and the renewing of your mind. Isn't that interesting? Verse 2 speaks so realistically. Paul understands we're up against it. You're up against it. Do not conform any longer to the pattern of this world. It's so challenging, isn't it? The world wants us to conform to its shape, its understanding, its values, its ethics, its morals. No, says Paul, be transformed through the renewing of your mind. It's the reminder that you've got things you need to understand as a Christian. It doesn't matter this morning whether you've been a Christian 50, 60, even longer than that years. You do not know it all. That's why coming to hear the word of God is so important that we do not set ourselves in judgment on it. It's no good when you turn to Romans 12. Ah, oh, Romans 12, I've heard hundreds of sermons on Romans 12. I know what it's about. No, there needs to be humility. Why? We need this renewing of the mind and we need, need it on a daily basis. The impetus for Christian living, biblically, comes through the mind. There's a wonderful place for emotions, and emotions are not stressed enough by us, and they should be. There are healthy Christian gospel emotions that we should never be ashamed of, and that they should be very much a part of our Christian experience. But it's not emotions that drive the Christian life, it's the mind. So is your mind on the view of God's mercy? Keep it there every day. Understand. Jesus Christ is God. He has died for you. And as a result, as Paul is saying here, no sacrifice can be too great for you to make for him. Well, the point is, of course, that it is sacrifice. And our sacrifice is our act of worship. 
I want to ask you this morning, what have you sacrificed to Jesus Christ during this past week? When were the times when you said no to self and yes to him for Jesus Christ during this past week? A whole of our lives are to be lived in an attitude, says Paul, as living perpetual sacrifices. Well, we better crack on, otherwise we're going to run out of time again, aren't we? And verse 9 to verse 21, we began looking at this last week, and we saw that there is a structure here as kind of um, rapid-fire statements as they are, following on from the fact that it is the gospel that's driving this living. There is structure here. And one of the ways that some commentators find the structure is they actually look at the phrase in verse 9, Love must be sincere, hate what is evil, and cling to what is good. That's a kind of opening introduction. Now Paul's beginning to unpack this with some more detailed principle. But one of those words, and it's the middle section, hate what is evil, we find this, the word evil is repeated, in, or it occurs, in two other places in this section, verse 9 to verse 21. And when we follow that, we see that it forms a sort of framework. Hate what is evil, verse 9. Verse 17, do not repay anyone evil for evil. Verse 21, do not be overcome by evil, but overcome evil with good. And we realise that that sort of provides us with a pattern, and I think we need it, don't we? Otherwise, you've just got so much data here, all of a sudden, dumped into our laps by Paul. It's fascinating, isn't it? For these 11 chapters, he's been slowly building arguments which are detailed, well-paced, nuanced, and then you come to chapter 12, it's as if suddenly, it's sort of one after another, he suddenly just throws all these things at us. So we need a structure. And the structure which I'm pursuing is that we have in verses 9 to 16, attitudes to other Christians. So we get phrases in verse 10, like one another, brotherly love, one another appears again in verse 10. Verse 13, do you see what's there? God's people, verse 19, one another. So verses 9 to 16, Paul seems to be speaking about principles of behaviour towards other Christians within the body of Christ. And then verses 17 to 21, you see more general statements about folks, well, as verse 17 says, everybody. Verse 18, everyone. And crucially, verse 20, your enemy. So it seems as if verse 17 to 21 is really about attitudes to those outside of the church. That's the framework we're following. Now, last week, and I put these up on the screen simply because there's so much information here to help you remember. Attitudes to those within the church. And we looked, first of all, at how we are to get on with the work. The work of the that Christ has given us to do in the church. The work of loving one another, supporting one another, and also, of course, taking the gospel to the world. And verse 11 tells us that we are never to be lacking in zeal, but we are to keep our spiritual fervor serving the Lord. So the work is to be done passionately in a way of total commitment. We discussed this on Tuesday night, didn't we? What does it mean? to keep, never be lacking in zeal and keep your spiritual fervour. And then secondly, we looked last week at how we live when the going gets tough. Verse 12, be joyful in hope. When do you need hope? You need it when things are going downhill. Patient in affliction, faithful in prayer. That our testimony and witness to one another in times of difficulty matters. Please don't ever be that kind of Christian who's only ever happy when they're talking about what's going wrong in their life and talks about it in the most miserable, gloomy terms. Yes, we face dire situations sometimes where we need much hope and patience and faithfulness because we're facing real situations of affliction. But here we've been reminded that we can yet still live positively in the face of our problems because the gospel ultimately is taking us to victory in Jesus Christ. There's nothing more wonderful, is there, often when you meet a Christian who's going through tough times and it's so obvious that it's tough and yet there's a radiance about their faith and a confidence in God. It's wonderfully challenging as it ministers to other believers. 
Well, the third thing we saw was that we are to strengthen friendships within the church. Verse 13, share with God's people who are in need, practice hospitality. I encouraged you to do that last week. I wonder if you did during last week. Did you reach out to another brother or sister who you don't really know that well in the life of the church here? You opened your home. Have you gone out for coffee or something like that? You've been generous to another Christian. You see, the gospel drives even this. We have received so much from God, so much that we have by being in Christ. The gospel has given us so much. We now are to share it and be generous. Don't be a miser. Don't be tight as a Christian when it comes to being generous. We need strong friendships, and these often come by sharing with those who are in need. Well, now we come to what we kind of ran out of time for last week, how we respond when friendships go wrong. Now, it's one of the wonderful things, isn't it, about Scripture, is that it is so honest and so realistic. There is not an idealistic view of the Christian life. As Paul writes this, he knows that there can be tensions, there can be difficulties, Verse 14 tells us, bless those who persecute you, bless and do not curse. Now it does seem that the context here, although it's very easy to think of this in terms of Roman Empire persecuting Christians and that sort of thing, but the context really is speaking about attitudes within the church. And the reality is there can be times when Christians behave so badly to one another that it is tantamount to persecution And those situations can be very, very provocative. Richard Sibbs, my favourite Puritan, the Oxford Anglican, back many, many years ago, one of his writings says, the worst sins are committed inside the church. It's very, very sobering that. He's got an essay called The Saint's Safety in Evil Days. And he's actually speaking about when evil is done within the church. And it can happen. Now, you might find that hard to believe, but it can happen. Christians can behave extremely badly to one another. And counterfeit Christians, those who claim to be Christ, but in the final analysis will be seen not to, may infiltrate the church and cause us much harm. Paul knew about this. Listen to these words he writes in his second letter to Timothy, chapter 4, verse 14. Alexander the metal worker did me a great deal of harm. The Lord will repay him for what he has done. Now, he's not speaking of someone outside of the church. Whoever this character was, and whatever he had done, it had caused Paul, as he says there, a great deal of harm. So things can go wrong between Christians. Paul's letter to the Philippians. Two women, excellent gospel workers, Yodia and Syntyche, fall out. There is a massive disagreement. You don't need to be a great sort of thinking exegete of Greek to realise the human emotions that must have been aroused there in Philippi between those two women who were so well known. Now Paul's point is that when this happens, and it can happen, and if it happens to you, how are you to respond? How does the gospel set the agenda for you to respond? And here in verse 14, he makes it so clear. Bless those who persecute you. Bless and do not curse. Why does he say bless and do not curse? Because it's very easy to curse people when you feel people are being unkind to you, particularly Christians who should know better. Really can bring out the worst in you. And we can feel emotions towards them. We can feel angry, hurt, disappointed, bitter, and left undealt with, unchecked. These feelings can fester in such a way as the New Testament speaks about a root of bitterness forming. So you get situations where Christians have fallen out, things have not been dealt with properly, and there's not been reconciliation, things have not been worked through Christianly, the gospel has not driven behaviour, what happens? You hear terrible stories. 
Christians seeing another Christian in the town and walking the other way or turning their back on them or not talking to them. Now all of that's a denial of the gospel, isn't it? It's a denial of our oneness. It's a denial of the work of Christ. So they have to be dealt with. So here Paul says there is a better way. There really is. And actually, I don't know, I, in terms of pastoral ministry now, I've been around long enough to know that I think actually deep down inside, when you have an authentic Christian and another authentic Christian who for whatever reason have fallen out or there's tensions, I do believe that deep down inside both really do want to put it right. So how do we put it right? Well, says Paul, there's a better way and the way is the way of blessing. Be constructive towards them. Do not curse. That is, do not gossip about them to other people. Don't run them down. Don't harbour, though, dwell on negative thoughts. Don't play out scenarios in your mind. Don't go over the old stuff, the inflammatory stuff, again and again and again. No, do what 1 Corinthians 13 tells us love does. Keep no record of wrongs. Let it go. Be willing, seek to bless, seek to do good where you can do good. Remember when I was a, a little boy being wonderfully challenged actually about the whole issue of Christian living. There was a, a, a teenager in the church, often little boys look up to older, slightly older role models. He was a great chap and you know, he, he used to take time to talk to me and I used to think the world of him. But I can remember my, overhearing my parents talking and they very rarely I had the opportunity to do that because they were as tight as anything when it came to talking about church life in front of us as children. But I can remember hearing them talking about this chap, about how he'd been bullied at school. And he was a Christian, this young teenage lad, and he was being bullied terribly at school by, by a, a, another, another boy who was giving him a terrible time. Uh, anyway, this Christian lad was cycling to school one day and he saw this fellow at the side of the road with a flat tyre on his bicycle. And so what did he do? Did he kind of laugh at him and uh, cycle off into the distance? No, he stopped and he helped him repair the tyre. And I can remember as a kid being really struck by that, thinking how difficult that must be because I was being bullied at school at the time. And I thought, that's almost impossible. And that's the issue, isn't it? It is impossible. This is the life the gospel calls us to. And so when we read biographies today of Christians in parts of the world experiencing unbelievable persecution, those being executed and tortured in the most horrific ways, <coughs> praying for their persecutors as they die. Why? Well, that's actually the way of our master, isn't it? Father, forgive them. They know not what they do. So there's always a better way, verse 14 tells us. And if you're holding on to stuff today about you and another Christian, you really do have to deal with this. Because as you hold on to it, it will damage you. It will make you prickly. It will, make you, it will dull your joy. It will dull your sense of God's love. And the only way to deal with it is through the grand view of God's mercy towards you. So Christians are not to be grudge holders. Instead, we're to be those who <coughs> seek the better way when friendship goes, goes wrong. Well, the final thing I think you see in this particular section, verse 9 to verse 16, is that Paul speaks about how we should help others, other believers. Verse 15, rejoice with those who rejoice, mourn with those who mourn. Live in harmony with one another. Do not be proud, but be willing to associate with people of low position. Do not be conceited. Now, there's an awful lot of material here, but just the basic principles, which I trust you will pray through and work through in your own life. Rejoice with those who rejoice, mourn with those who mourn. Be authentic in your responses with other people. Don't be begrudging towards someone else whose life has been blessed by God in a way in which maybe yours aren't. Karen and I are both trying to lose a bit of weight at the moment, and she's doing really well, and I'm not. And we get on the, she gets on the scale, she's, oh, great, another pound, another two pound. And immediately, because I'm a sinner, 
what goes through my mind is, well, why isn't it working for me? <laughs> now, that's what Paul says you're not to be like, all right? Instead, we're to rejoice with those who rejoice. This is more than just about empathy, which should be there. This is about delighting in what God is doing in someone else's life. Now, isn't that interesting? It is reality, isn't it? That sometimes you can hear of somebody who's been blessed in a way that you, you haven't. And if we're really honest, we can be a bit jealous, can't we? It's wrong. <coughs> Gospel calls us to something better. To rejoice with those who rejoice. But then, crucially, mourn with those who mourn. And I don't think we have a problem there. I think we all understand that. But there's an important emphasis here that we are to empathise with people. And sometimes, particularly when it comes to mourning, that is all we can do. It is so wrong to try and fix someone's grief, sometimes. It's a really wrong thing to do. Mourning and grieving is a natural, necessary part of the human experience. Uh, we go on holiday. I've got to know uh, in France in the summer, the sun is fixed, you know, guaranteed, and it's only 10 quid a night. It's lovely and cheap on the campsite. And uh, I've got to know lots of people from around Europe. One of my, he's become really a very good friend. He's a Danish psychotherapist. And he's not a Christian. We have some interesting chats. And, uh, but he was telling me about his work. And he said, Philip, he said, one of the most important things I had learned was taught me by a Swedish clever guy. And he said he was watching me treating a patient. And he said I was trying to say something. And all of a sudden, he said he interrupted the session. And he said, stop, stop, stop. And my friend Lars says, you're not supposed to do that. Yeah. And then this Swedish guy said, I will only say this once. A bit like Mission Impossible. So listen very carefully. And then he came out with this phrase. Don't fix it. Just be there. That struck me. As Christians, we want to be fixers, particularly when it comes to sorrows. We see someone mourning, ah, but there is these, all the promises of God. Yes, but there is a time when mourning is right. And sometimes we need to do less attempts to fix things, but to be there. Because when we're really up against it, that's what we want. We want someone who sits next to us in the darkness and holds our hand as a Christian brother and a Christian sister. And isn't afraid to do that. Again, my first year in secondary school, one of the girls in the class, her father died, which was terribly traumatic. He died very suddenly. He had a heart attack. And we all knew it was terrible. She was off school for a while, and then she came back. We just didn't know what to say. We were young kids. We hadn't experienced life. We didn't know what to say. And so what happened? We didn't say anything. I certainly didn't. I think the majority of the class didn't say anything. We're not to be like that as Christians. When we see people in need, we see people in distress, we are to reach out to them. We're not to professionalise it, that it's just a job for the pastor or the elders or the deacons. No, this is a ministry we're to have to one another. And we're to care for one another. Well, those are at least five sort of subcategories of what we can look at here in verses 9 to 16. And you will see the reminder here is that relationships within the church are to be different. They're to be special. Life within the Christian community is to be attractive. I think I may have mentioned to you before, again, when I was growing up, there was a, a Welsh chap who lived in the town where we lived in southwest London. He was a very, very a very capable businessman, extremely <laughs> brilliant. And he had an accident one day, he fell off a ladder and he had severe brain trauma. And uh, his business went and he was, but and he used to be arrested by the police because they thought he was drunk by the way he was slurring and staggering. And, you know, he, his life was turned upside down. But he started coming to church. And I can remember him saying in our home, I like coming to this church through this very distorted, slurring voice, because I feel safe here. I feel safe here. And that's how it's to be when the world meets us. They say, this is special. I don't understand all this stuff about Jesus. I haven't a clue what to make of the resurrection or the Bible, but I can't deny the fact these people are special. 
Is that what it's like amongst us? May God enable it to be so and to grow in this. Well, the second section that we have, we better move on. I'm pressing madly. Yeah, there we are. Is the second big section, which is verse 17 to 21. There's just three things here, and we kind of conclude with these today. That are attitudes to those outside of the church. Now, this really matters, doesn't it? It really matters. There is so much bad press about church. People's experience of church is so negative. It's one of the things I'm actually going to try and explore tonight with, in terms of the ministry. And um, it can be so devastating. My grandfather, who probably did come to faith at the end of his life, uh, was brought up in rural Montgomery, uh, semi-illiterate farm labourer. And hears the sound of a guy drowning in the river and risks his own life to pull him out. It was a local curate, blind drunk. A massive impact on him and his attitude towards Christians. It's only when my mother brought my father home to meet the family that that began to be sort of challenged and unpicked. People's experience of us matters. This is what Paul is saying here. If the view of God's mercy is so small that it doesn't affect the way we reach out, the way we relate the way we live with folks who are not Christians. If, if all we do is present to the world an idea that somehow we are sour and negative and bitter and angry and angry with them all the time, then our view of God's mercy needs to be challenged, doesn't it? Well, there's less to say here because it's so obvious, but the first thing Paul points us to in verse 17 then is very simply, watch how you live. Do not repay anyone evil for evil. Be careful to do what is right in the eyes of everybody. Now remember he's writing to some of this church, are Jewish people who've had to run for their lives. They may have lost loved ones. They have had great evil done to them. And in our sinful nature, when evil is done to us, what do you want to do? I remember going for my interview when I went to be a physiotherapist. I think they were a bit worried because there was a lot of church stuff in my application. And the, the principal saying to me, so it's Saturday afternoon, he says, and the other props just punched you. What do you do? So I said, I hit him back harder. That's what I said in my interview. Because that's what it's like in life, isn't it? That's what the sinful nature does. We repay evil with evil. That's what sin wants us to do. Somebody's got at you. Somebody's trashed you on Facebook. Somebody's gossiped about you. Somebody's been unkind to you and unfair to you in the workplace. What do you want to do? You want to get even. I know, says Paul. The gospel calls us to something different. The view of God's mercy. Do not repay anyone evil for evil. Don't go down that line. Steer well clear of it. Peter writing about Jesus and his sufferings in 1 Peter 2, 23. A massively important verse. When they hurled their insults at him, he did not retaliate. When he suffered, he made no threats. Instead, he entrusted himself to him who judges justly. He's speaking of the cross. And there is a sense he's speaking of the moments when they nail him to the cross. When any condemned person would curse and curse and curse his executioners. He didn't do that. Now this is not easy. It cuts against the grain. Someone cuts in front of you in the queue in Tesco's. Or they cut you up at the traffic lights. Immediately there's an almost reflex action, but we have to overcome this. Why? We have to remember that the gospel drives the whole of life. And that we're, followed to be, we're called to be followers of Christ. And serve. And live as living sacrifices. So, do you realise that in those situations where you feel you have every right to get even. And every opportunity and every means to get even. That by not getting even, you're actually preaching the gospel to the world. Have you thought about it in those constructive terms? You see, Paul's whole thrust here in chapter 12 is life isn't about you. 
Now you are to be a living sacrifice. Those moments when you keep your mouth shut and don't seize the opportunity to trash someone else. When you behave instead of repaying evil with evil but instead doing what is right you preach the gospel to the world the world needs this society needs this I know there's the stuff on the big stage with the politicians and, and the thinkers and the, the, the media but Paul is here isn't he? he's really dealing with the nitty-gritty stuff he's, he's dealing about the stuff in the playground he's dealing about the stuff in the bus queue the stuff that goes on in the coffee shop or in the restaurant or whenever you meet up with other people. As a Christian, you're called to something much better. Do not repay anyone evil for evil. And then we get the second one, which is, um, he says, pressing again madly. Well, here we are. Seek peace. Verse 18. If it is possible, as far as it depends on you, Live at peace with everyone. Now Jesus has told us in the Beatitudes, blessed are the peacemakers, for they will be called sons of God. Christians are to be peacemakers. So when you're in that situation and you hear someone gossiping about someone else and everyone pitching in and distortion and exaggeration and rumour and all of this stuff going on, don't buy into it. Don't go there as a Christian. People will notice. You might say, well, I did nothing. I just kept my mouth shut. People didn't even know I was really there. They were so carried away in the situation where they were just dissing someone. You say, no, reality is they do know you're there. They do. And they know you're different because you're not entering into it. Seek peace. Try to remind people that there are always two sides to every issue. That one person's story is never the complete story. Pursue peace. Now, Paul is a pastor and he knows, he's realistic. He says, as far as it depends on you, live at peace with everyone. I think he's got in mind state-sanctioned persecution here. When Roman authorities commanded Roman soldiers and Roman citizens to persecute Christians. Now, you can't do anything about that. You can't. You can't really live at peace with Nero or whoever it is. You can't deal with that. But what you can, there are things you can deal with. Your own attitude to those who come after you. You can deal with that. And you must deal with that. So don't look at verse 18 and say, well, you know, Okay, it says I should live at peace, but it also says as far as it depends on, you know, as much as you, you're able, if it is possible, rather, verse 18, and, and this other person is totally impossible, so it can't be done. That's how some people approach verse 18. It's wrong. It's wrong. That's not what he's talking about. What he's reminding us is that there are always things that depend on us. Our attitude is to be right. And so let me ask you here, are you a peacemaker or are you a stirrer? Might sound a little bit direct this morning, but you know your heart and I know mine. Are you a peacemaker or are you a stirrer? You're called to be a peacemaker. The gospel calls us to be Christ followers. He is the Prince of Peace. Lastly, in all of this, we see perhaps the biggest challenge of all, which is that we are to love Batteries, new batteries. Love our neighbours. Verse 19 to verse 21. Now he gives us quite an extended section here. Let me quickly read it. Do not take revenge, but leave room for God's wrath. It is mine to avenge, I will repay, says the Lord. Instead, verse 20, if your enemy is hungry, feed him. If he's thirsty, give him something to drink. In doing so, you will heap burning coals on his head. By the way, there is a perverse logic among some Christians who say if you really want to do your enemy a bit of harm, be nice to them. That's actually not what verse uh, 20 is saying. All right, so you might think the idea of heaping burning coals on your enemy, is it? Oh, that's rather nice. I like the sound of that. I better go out and feed them and give them something to drink. That is not what Paul is saying here, okay? So don't go away thinking that. But isn't it interesting how twisted 
sinful thinking, even amongst us as Christians, can lead to that. No, the point is this. We're never to take revenge, never to get even and take the issue into our own hands. What do we mean by that? Well, there are times when things need to be said in the right way, at the right time, and in the right context. But we're never to go further than we need to. There's never to be anything selfishly gratuitous about it. You know, like when some of you chaps were playing rugby at school, you know, what, you knew what it was to hit someone really, really hard within the rules, but it was more than just bringing them down. There was a bit more to it. That was, that's what revenge is. It's adding that extra bit that makes you feel better about yourself. And you can do it so easily in the conversation. You can do it by what you don't do, by what you don't say, and you can do it by what you do say and what you do do. But what does Paul say here? Do not do it. Do not take revenge. Instead, give it to God. Hand it over. Leave room for God's wrath. It is mine to avenge. I will repay. We have many, many challenges then, don't we? About our attitudes. Attitudes matter. Is your attitude right in terms of relationships within the church? Is your attitude right to those outside of the church? Taking this on board is impossible and must not be seen outside of that great priority that we do this, all of this, and more, in view of God's mercy. We need that big view. Pray for it. Seek it every day. That our living like this may not be hardship, but it may be, as Paul says, our spiritual act of worship.